Well, the old saying, desperate times call for desperate measures. Today's desperate measure is resorting to the old beating trade. I'm determined to have a really good go at finding a ladybird, striped ladybird, which has eluded me on numerous occasions since I first did a video when I was looking for it, I believe, around Christmas or earlier this year. This is Clipston Forest, as was now called Sherwood Pines. And I've walked along this bottom section here, keeping to the sunny side of these mature pines. There's a new pine plantation that is in the early stages of growth, just to your right and my left. And the top of all these young pines, there are numbers of seven spot ladybirds. It's a fantastic year for seven spot ladybirds. I think they're going to peak this year. But some singles at the top of the trees or young trees, but others, there's so many as seven or eight. And I've found nearly every species of ladybird I'd expect to find at the moment. I've found lots of seven spots, five harlequins, one cream streaked, one pine ladybird, and about five minutes ago, of this overhanging pine here, I took orange ladybird, which I was surprised at on pine, but also our largest ladybird, and that's eyed ladybird. Everything but a striped ladybird, and that's what I'm after again today. Sharp ladybirds proved to be one of those really elusive insects. I don't mind that. In fact, I quite enjoy the challenge. And I know at this very moment, Nick and Samantha Brownlee are also enjoying that challenge. But on the former side of the Calverton Colliery down towards Nottingham, I'm a little bit further north in more typical forested country of Sherwood Forest. There are few modern records of striped ladybird and I have a sneaky feeling that the most modern or recent records are those that Dillis and I had many years ago on Bubby South Forest and those were found they were lava and pupating lava and they were found on very weak spindly pines growing underneath mature pines not unlike an habit a habitat such as this there's a, a mix of trees here Scots pine but also this AB's grandis, the grand fir, I think they call it. There's a few examples of that in here. So it's a case of beating the lower foliage of pine trees. And I'm particularly choosing those pine trees that are obtaining some of this early morning sunshine. It's going to be a very nice, pleasant day today. But as many times as I beat and look at pines I'm perhaps just as likely to find it crawling across the path in front of me or sat somewhere on a fence post although ultimately I don't care where it is I just love to see one again and get the chance to photograph it because it is an absolutely beautiful ladybird and extremely different so it's a case of wandering through here we'll go back onto the path and just check everything And here's that eyed ladybird that I mentioned at the start to this video. This is our largest ladybird that we have here in the UK. And despite being very similar on first appearance to the succinia form of harlequin ladybird, the spotting on eyed ladybird here does differentiate from harlequin ladybird. And that differentiation is by the yellowing that pale area around the spots you can see that now she's starting to move now she's warming up in the sun but beautiful this one's a chestnut color to the elytra but they can be very red but it's a handsome species and this one is a large female and she measured a centimeter 
from the back of the elytra to the front of the head. Maybe time to try a different tactic and on a different tree. These are your typical Christmas trees, which if I remember right, are Norway spruce. There's one or two seven spots that are sat on the growing tips of these Norway spruce, but also on the stems, the main stems. Could a striped ladybird be tucked in? with them. I am surprised that in habitat such as this that a striped ladybird is still proving difficult to find. They may well be that striped ladybird is quite rare or exceptionally rare in Nottinghamshire. I certainly know of rarer nationally RDB1 and 2 species that are easier to find than this. I'm just walking through this young plantation of these trees and there are many seven spot ladybirds, most sat at the top of the growing tip, just in the manner of these three here. And indeed on this tree, there's another couple of seven spots on this particular tree, but on the tree at the back there you can see on the left there are another three or four right at the top clustered together there must be thousands tucked away at the top of these trees here in this plantation area oh we've got a cream streaked ladybird it's this top one here that sort of lovely dark chestnut color and the pronutum it's very different to those of the seven spots that accompany this cream street. There are about eight or nine seven spots on this young Scots pine. And this is the third cream street that I found. It's a glorious day. Perfect conditions for looking for striped lady here, but despite a lot of searching, no joy as yet. I've continued to work my way through the plantation small area of Christmas trees, as you'd more likely know them as, rather than Norway spruce. And I've always, there's more ladybirds on the tops of those and on the stems of Norway spruce than there are of this area of Scots pine. These are all young Scots pine, of course. And a little bit of Internet research has revealed that AB's grandis, which is the grand fir, if I remember right, of which there are some here, is a favoured plant for striped ladybird, as is Scots pine. Another one, surprisingly, is silver birch. My old friend, the silver birch. So it broadens the amount of tree trunks that I have to look at now. Could well be that. A silver birch trunk tucked anywhere in the Sherwood Forest area could hold a striped ladybird. I'd like to think though that one is tucked in with some seven spots in one of these. But it's a beautiful day for doing this. It's a, a lovely setting. It's very quiet here today, surprisingly, for an Easter weekend. I thought there'd be a lot more mountain bikers and dog walkers than what there actually are. I've seen relatively few people, far fewer than I expected to see. Well, I'm excited. You may well be able to tell by the state of my voice because the reason for my excitement is this beautiful beetle here. 
This isn't Striped Ladybird, of course. Nothing ladybird-like about this particular beetle. It is a weevil, and it's a good size. From the end of the elytra to probably the front of the rostrum, which you can't see very well here. Hopefully I'll be able to get some better photos and put them in. It's a good centimetre in length. And sorry about the light, now the sun's come out. But... I know that I've not seen a weevil like this. The coloration is one giveaway. It's almost a metallic turquoise colour. It appeared very blue when I initially saw it, but under certain lights it can almost appear quite green. And I know that I've never seen this species before. I know it's a weevil, but I don't know what it is. And for me to have not seen something in Nottinghamshire, it may sound to be quite a big head of this, but if I haven't seen anything in Nottinghamshire, there's a good chance that I haven't seen it in Nottinghamshire because it's rare. This is almost certainly going to turn out to be a, a pine feeding species. It has to be because it's in the middle of a pine plantation. But in all the beating that I've done over the years and today, I have not seen anything like this and I need to pot it and pot it quick. So right, I was just listening to a couple of ravens which were milling around over there by the sound of it but it just goes to show you how a day can change and counting something as ordinary and throwaway in terms of coleopterist value and interest as seven spot ladybirds can pay dividends. However, it's not paid dividends with the elusive striped ladybird, but I've got this lot to work my way down through. I'm heading over there towards the mature, some mature oaks, and there's a dead birch in there as well. And I will continue to have a look on the tops of these pines. Spring days like this, you never really can be entirely sure what turns up because on these first warm days, everything that's been overwintering underground or in the leaf litter starts to come up. And in order to dry the wings potentially and take flight, they have to climb something. And so it's just complete chance that I happened to pass the very pine where that weevil was sat on the top of and about to fly. Even amazing that it didn't drop completely to the floor and that was able to get it. And so the first plan of attack on returning home will be to identify it. I can't wait, actually. And I'll put the results of it at the end of this video because there's a poor internet signal here. And I like to identify things in front of the PC, get the photos uploaded onto the PC and identify things that way. So we'll see, but in the meantime, we're heading that way over there. Well, back at the car, and a successful visit, if not for the hoped for species. There's always another time though. But now, it's time to go home, pour myself a drink with a head on it, and have a look at the photographs that I've got of the weevil that I've found. I'm very excited to see what this will turn out to be. In all probability, it'll be something quite uncommon in Nottinghamshire. Maybe it'll be a county first, who knows, but we shall see. We've got to get home before then. Well then, do we have an answer? Do we have an identification for the mystery weevil? That's a beautifully blue weevil that no matter how much I tried to photograph it in various lights and from various angles, never did produce or photograph in the same blue as when I initially saw it at the top of that small pine tree. And there it appeared as blue as some of the blue leaf beetles, species like Altiga lithri, and even 
the older leaf beetle, it really did appear that blue. And that's why, to be honest, I went for it and managed to successfully put my hand underneath it, knowing that many beetles, as soon as you approach them, will drop. So, successful that way. But I haven't had the beetle officially identified yet, and that's purely because I haven't took it down to Adrian Dutton, the Nottinghamshire County Recorder for Beetles, and I will be doing it in the next couple of days. But I'm 100% certain, as, as I can be, that it is indeed Modalis phlegmatica, and that would be a first for Nottinghamshire, and one of very few records for England. Looking at the MBN Atlas, which I'll put up now, you'll see that there are a couple of unconfirmed records from England, one in the northern part of Cumbria, and indeed Adrian Dutton, the county recorder, has had Magdalis Phlegmatica from Grasmere, I believe. But there are a couple of records from Yorkshire area, and presumably they are from pine forested areas of Yorkshire. But the only confirmed records that the NBN Atlas lists for Magdalis Phlegmatica are from northern central Scotland, presumably in the pine forest there. And it is a species which feeds and lives on dead pines, I believe. So in a way, not really surprising that a species like Magdalis Phlegmatica could turn up in the middle of a large area of pine forested commercial crops in the middle of Nottinghamshire. But when you look at a species' national, national distribution and you see how limited it is, it makes you a little bit suspect and a little bit more careful. However, there's no other real candidate that it could be, at least not the to this side of the continent or of the channel. And that's what we need to rule out. And that's why I need to take it down to Adrian so Adrian can look at it properly, confirm it, and we follow the usual procedures and the practice procedures for new species. And it gets confirmed then and gets recorded appropriately. So, at the moment, I think it's Magdalis Phlegmatica. If it isn't, there'll be another video. But looking at the photos, it, either way, it's a cracking thing.